So the first speaker is uh, Nikhil Swamy from Microsoft, and uh, he will uh, make us excited about F Sharp. Okay, go ahead. Hi everyone. Um, um, I hope you'll get excited about F Sharp and F Star also. And um... oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm, I think this online format is not going to have some of those benefits, but it seems to be to have many other benefits. It's great to see um, so many of you here. Uh, uh, and maybe in future years, there would be some hybrid form where people could, could attend both remotely and physically. Um, uh, and thanks to, to, to Zena and Jim and Paul and everyone for organizing. Um, uh, and for inviting me, I was I, I was also here in 2019 and enjoyed it a, a lot as well as a, as a teacher and um, and I also remember Bob's lectures from from when I was a student. So uh, uh, which, which, uh, which uh, fond memories of that as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen. I, I don't use Zoom too much, so let me see if this works. Um, Do you all see my screen? I can see it. Okay, good. Um, let me go to full screen. Uh, right, so um, I'm going to, uh, over the next you know uh, four days, tell you a bit about FSTAR and uh, this, this idiom in FSTAR that we call proof-oriented programming. Um, uh, I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research in, in Redmond, and um, uh, the work I'm going to tell you about is, is work by a large team of people, uh, um, maybe more than 20, 30 people who have contributed to, uh, to all this work. And, uh, uh, so, um, uh, and, and I'll, I'll mention them as, as we go. Uh, this was the advertised title of the talk, Proof Oriented Programming in FSTAR. Um, I think it's really going to be more about this really, uh, this title, which is more uh, accurate, I think, embedded, embedding proof-oriented programming languages in FSTAR. Um, and um, uh, you, you'll see what I mean by that um, shortly. Uh, so, um, uh, oh, I should say, I, I actually, uh, before diving in, um, uh, I think it's traditional for Bob to kick off these lectures and um, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to both Bob and Zena for, for letting me kick off uh, instead. I think the reason was that I was expecting to be in India at this point, um, uh, visiting family, and uh, this was this morning slot was going to be easier for, for scheduling, but um, uh, for various pandemic reasons, I'm in fact in Seattle, and, um, uh, but the schedule has remained the same. So, so thank you to both Zena and Bob for being accommodating. Uh, so, um, uh, so broadly, we, I, I'm, you know, uh, uh, these lectures are about, you know, a, how, how to produce high assurance software. And uh, there's many things you can do and there's many, many simple things that you can start with and even very trivial things like turning on compiler warnings gets you a long way towards uh, avoiding um, uh, many basic kinds of errors. And surprisingly enough, even, you know, even basic things like turning on all warnings in your compiler are not often um, um, used in practice. And for instance, there was this go-to fail bug in uh, implementations of TLS that should have been caught by a compiler warning, uh, but weren't and led to catastrophic bugs. Uh, so, you know, turn your warnings on, don't ignore them. Uh, um, then there's, of course, things like, you know, a um, bit more than compiler warnings. There's tons of program static analysis tools that search through your program, programs to find bugs. And uh, there's many companies out there, um, including some tools here by uh, Microsoft, I would think, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that um, uh, you know, do static analysis on your, on your code at scale and try to find bugs. Um, but bug finding is only going to get you so far. It, these things are useful, you know, uh, you should do them. But if you want really high assurance software, that is software that's running in domains that are, uh, say, um, uh, you know, controlling really critical systems or responsible for, uh, uh, for human lives and so on, then you really want uh, more certainty than simply uh, the kind of things that uh, 
uh, bug finding tools can uh, can give you. And for that, what um, uh, you know, the, the community of researchers working in our field, many of us advocate is to to do program proofs and to do them at scale. So um, by this, what I mean is um, to develop mathematical specifications of properties like the correctness and security of your programs and to machine check proofs that the code that you implement does not deviate from that mathematical spec. And to do this in a, in a foundational way against a, a formal machine model of, of, of what your software is gonna run on and for it to be integrated in a sense that there's a single theorem that covers all the code. Um, and this agenda, which has been, uh, I think, a, a, uh, a, um, a sort of a, a long-term goal of, of many computer scientists for uh, five, six decades or more, in the last, say, 10 to 15 years, I think we've, we've seen a number of successes that, that, are, uh, that are suggesting that um, these kinds of proofs can really be done at scale, at scale that previously um, was not really possible. And some highlights of this are things like um, our, uh, for instance, the, the ComSearch C compiler um, by um, uh, Xavier Leroy and, um, and, and now a large team of people um, and a large community around, uh, around ComSearch. Um, for me, at least, in, when I was a grad student around 2005, when ComSearch came out, um, uh, there was a Popple paper about it. it uh, I think it, 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 sort of, it blew my mind, and I think it was very kind of influential in the community to, to realize that you can use a proof assistant like Coq to develop real software and to prove it correct end to end. And I think that that sort of uh, um, uh, adjusted what people's um, uh, perceptions were for, for the goalposts of, of, of program verification at scale. And, um, and there have been others too, things like the SEL4 verified microkernel in, in Isabel Hall is, a, is another landmark. Uh, and in, in the past decade or so, there have been many such systems that have been produced at scale. Uh, uh, this, um, I mentioned one more here, uh, uh, Ironclad and Iron Fleet, a, a couple of projects from, uh, from MSR, building verified distributed systems in, um, in, in Daphne. Um, and there have been, the, if you uh, there, there's really too many to mention these days. There's, there's tons of these systems that are built at scale, um, uh, both in the programming languages community, but also in uh, in the systems community. The, in uh, conferences like uh, OSDI and uh, uh, SOSB often have uh, a track devoted to verified systems, and this is this is really uh, beginning to take off. Uh, so. Um, uh, the, the particular um, set of um, uh, verified systems that I'm going to talk about are uh, uh, related to a project called Project Everest that I've been involved with for the, five, for the past five years or so, so since 2016, roughly. Um, uh, a, a team of researchers at, uh, uh, at Microsoft, uh, at uh, INRIA in, in Paris, and uh, at CMU and uh, a few other places have been, um, we've been trying to build, and importantly, I think a, a big goal for us is, has been to build and deploy uh, system components with proofs of correctness and security, deploy within the existing software infra infrastructure. We've been focusing on secure communication software, things like uh, TLS and Quick, and uh, TLS is the, the protocol that underlies um, uh, uh, secure internet communications, things like um, HTTPS and so on, all these, uh, these very widely used protocols, the underlying cryptographic protocols that run them are, are uh, is a protocol called TLS, you may know it previously as SSL, um, and newer variants of it, think the Quick is a, is a redesign in some sense of, of, um, uh, of TLS around UDP instead of TCP, uh, things like this, we've been focusing on uh, secure communication software, but also secure subsystems, things like ensuring that um, uh, uh, systems that implement measured boot for, uh, uh, for um, IoT devices uh, or uh, high integrity uh, cloud-based key value stores, these kinds of things that, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, large systems depend on. Uh, another example is, for instance, the Merkle, chain, the Merkle trees that underlie uh, blockchain implementations. These uh, Components that are uh, 
uh, that are the the sort of the the, the core correctness and security kernel of a, of a, of a large service or uh, system. We've been focusing on building uh, high assurance implementations of those components. And we've been developing them in the F-star programming language, which is what I'm gonna teach you about. And uh, what one of the main things we've learned how to do in, in the past, in, in these this past five years is how to build and maintain formal proofs at scale. So, um, uh, multiple times a day, as we uh, all our code is developed open source on, on GitHub, our continuous integration system verifies and builds more than um, uh, about a year ago, it was around 600,000 lines of F star code and proof. And um, uh, it keeps growing. Um, and this in includes doing, uh, being able to scale to, to this size of code base and, and really, you know, maintaining proofs at this scale in involves doing, I think, two things. Um, the, the first is to get proof automation to work in the small. So in the sense that when you're trying to verify a program, there's uh, there are many, many small proof obligations that pop up in, in our uh, 600,000 line code base. This is on the order of a, a million or more um, small proofs about arithmetic, small proofs about uh, um, definiteness of um, uh, of uh, say the absence of, of, of overflow or underflow, these, these kinds of things. There's really, that there are millions of these kinds of proofs and having to do this, this sort of proof by hand is, can be overwhelming. Um, uh, so one of the things that we, that, that FSR focuses on is getting these kinds of small proofs to go automatically. And we do that by uh, feeding proofs to the SMT solver called Z3. Um, and um, uh, that allows us to scale. The other is that we've been designing a number of domain specific languages that are uh, carefully designed uh, for full automation of specific kinds of proofs. So uh, by programming in these DSLs, we, uh, we also reduce the, the proof burden. And then the, the other main idea that uh, helps this, this kind of proof to scale is that, well, you're never, at least I don't think you're ever gonna be able to take us a, a a code base of this of this scale and just throw it monolithically at a theorem prover and expect it to uh, to succeed. The way these proofs actually work are by building modular abstractions. You need to work in a language or in a, in a framework that gives you uh, the ability to sort of build modular abstractions and compose them. And um, and this allows you to sort of keep going in a way. You keep building. Uh, you know, uh, modules with proofs and uh, they can be arbitrarily complex, but the co code that relies on them only relies on their interface and you can kind of stack these abstractions. So um, I realized that I've just been talking for a bit and it, um, I don't have a way to monitor the or easily monitor the chat while I'm talking. So um, do interrupt me with questions. I think it's, it's more fun to be interactive. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, do um, uh, do interrupt or speak up and I'll hear you. Uh, uh, so um, so some of the things that we've been building are uh, in are, they've been building both sort of reusable verified artifacts and and tools. So uh, some of our uh, uh, verified artifacts include things like a cryptographic provider that's good, that implements a number of uh, uh, you know, a, a, a large number of cryptographic algorithms and constructions that are used in systems like measured boot or used in uh, Merkle trees and so on. All, all uh, a bunch of cryptographic tools we, we package together in this library that we call Evercrypt. Um, but we also build tools that uh, let you um, uh, that that let you verify other programs. So uh, or to build verified software easily. So Everparse is another is a, is a verified parser generator that we have that uh, lets you build. Uh, high assurance parsers for uh, uh, binary wire formats um, and uh, the, uh, the number of other such tools. For instance, DY star is a tool that lets you do symbolic crypto proofs about F star code. Um, so it's a mixture of verified artifacts and tools that we've been producing. And uh, the, the code that we've been producing, as I said earlier, we have a strong emphasis on trying to deploy our verified artifacts in within the existing software ecosystem. So uh, uh, at this point, um, it's, um, there's, uh, there are systems that are used by billions of people that have uh, bits of F-star proofs in them, uh, uh, hardening various pieces of, uh, of the existing software stack. So for instance, 
something that I'll tell you about, I think on uh, lecture three is about uh, what we've been doing with, um, uh, with net network virtualization in Microsoft's Hyper-V um, uh, virtual machine um, hypervisor, uh, where uh, we have code in there that is ensuring that every network message that passes through this network virtualization stack is first checked for validity by formally proven code produced by Everparse to ensure that uh, the rest of the system does not, for instance, get confused by malicious packets being sent, malicious ill-formed packets being sent by, by the adversary. Um, uh, in, uh, uh, there's, there's this thing called Azure Confidential Computing that is, uh, builds a blockchain. That blockchain is built upon a Merkle tree that is uh, a high-performance Merkle tree proven correct and secure developed in, in FSTAR. Uh, there's the cryptography that's uh, that in in software uh, some of the elliptic curve cryptography in um in firefox in um the wireguard uh vpn and the linux kernel these kinds of things are built using fstar um there's uh, some financial tech companies are beginning to use fstar for various um, internal needs um there's election software there's a, a open election guard protocol that uh, is a uh, being um, uh, developed by a consortium, but also uh, uh, led by Microsoft, where a bunch of the crypto is done by um, is done in FSTAR. So there's uh, you can build formal proofs these days that are uh, uh, that produce code that are real enough, both in terms of um, their performance and in terms of um, uh, improving the, the concrete security needs of real applications to have these be deployed and run in, in the existing ecosystem today. And I think that's that's really exciting. This this was not the case um, uh, a decade ago where you could get verified software running inside, say, the Microsoft Cloud. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a work, this is work by, by a large number of people, uh, uh, both um, uh, core team of contributors that's maybe 20 or so and uh, a, a large number of um, uh, people who have alumni people who have contributed over the years external contributors who have uh, um, uh, who have pitched in on, on various fronts and it's, it's open source so if you're, if you're interested in some of this stuff and feel like contributing uh, uh, we're more than happy to work with you uh, do reach out to us um, uh, the the best way to do this to reach out to us is um, is on a uh, is is on a Slack instance for for the Everest project. Uh, there's a link on it that appears um, in in a few slides. Um, uh, that said, it's it's still expensive to develop proofs at, at this scale. So the state of the art, I think, is that when you write sort of one line of code, you uh, you pay the cost of writing manual proofs. Depending on the code, uh, that ratio can be, for instance, if you're for the, the trickiest, most you know intricate libraries that you're that you're building, where you know there may be uh, you're you're defining new memory models or you're dealing with concurrency, uh, this uh, the ratio can be almost one line of code to twenty lines of proof, um, and this is especially so when you're using um, uh, interactive. Uh, pr proof tools where, where the, the main proof proving mechanism you have is by interactive tactics. Um, there are, I think, a more typical kind of proof overhead in, in most of our code is, is around five, where you write one line of code and, and, and five lines of proof to back it up. Uh, and uh, these are proofs where, you know, you're, you're, um, uh, a bunch of the proofs are being automated by either um, domain-specific tactics or by things like SMT solvers. And that's still quite a high overhead, uh, uh, but um, uh, but and is that a question? Oh, oh yes, I was wondering what is the tactic like? Would you be covering what a tactic is? Um, I'm not going to say too much about what a tactic is in this course. Uh, we have some other material online about about a tactic, but a tactic is I can say a few words about it now. A tactic is um, is a uh, a, a, a program that operates over proof goals and uh, manipulates proof goals according to the rules of uh, whatever logic you're working in. So, you know, you may have a, a, a goal that says, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, knowing that um, 
uh, x is an integer, prove that, uh, I don't know, x squared is uh, non-negative or something. Uh, uh, and you can apply the rules of arithmetic and the rules of logic to, um, to this proof goal. And um, uh, if your proofs have a certain structure, these programs that, that manipulate proof goals can uh, exploit that structure to build um, uh, sort of uh, partially automated or even in some cases fully automated scripts that can discharge these, go these goals. And that's kind of what a tactic is. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. I, I really, uh, uh, I really wish. I, I want to encourage you all to sort of uh, just. I think in a classroom in the in, in the past, I've, it's been always quite interactive and uh, happy to pause for questions. And uh, I have a lot of material that I want to cover, but I'd much prefer to cover less of it and chat with you folks rather than you know just steamroll you with tons of material. Uh, so do interrupt. Um, uh, we have some, so I'll keep going. So we have some instances where you can reduce this proof overhead to the point where you may write, um, uh, you know, one line of code and proof and get sort of five lines of code that you can execute. And this typically tends to be the case where, you know, uh, we've, you use a meta program to generate code from some description of what the code is, generate code and proof. Uh, um, and uh, and, and that's one way to, to reduce this proof overhead. And it's been, uh, we've used that quite successfully uh, in, uh, in, in many cases. And in some cases, you can, you know, uh, uh, this overhead, you know, if you're in a particular domain where, uh, for instance, we know exactly the kinds of proofs that you're expected to do, for um, and one instance of that is in the case of, say, parsers, there's a clear specification of what a parser is supposed to do. It, has, it should be the inverse of a serializer. Uh, for instance, uh, as a specification of a parser, uh, then uh, then we can fully automate such proofs. And um, uh, so, so trying to find the right, uh, you know, uh, work in the right abstraction so that the, the cost of these proofs are 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 low is really important. Um, uh, so uh, the the point I'm trying to make here is that you often write a lot more proof than code, um, and so it pays to work in a framework that's optimized for um, for proving and proof automation just as, as much as it is for programming. And, um, and it pays to structure a program with its proof in mind. Because if you take a piece of code that was just written, that's just you know, off the shelf and you try to prove something about it, the, um, you will quickly uh, be overwhelmed. You, you, you may start with 100 lines of code, but you'll soon be writing 2,000 lines of proof. And the fact that you started with this 100 lines of code you know, is, um, is quickly sort of lost in the in in all the proof you're writing. So it often pays to structure a program with its proof in mind, and uh, that's what I mean by by this proof-oriented programming. You develop programs and their proofs together, and this produces a number of good synergies. I think so. So first, the the proofs can be simpler because the program structure is designed to facilitate proof. Uh, you may structure your program in such a way that the invariants are more easily statable at, at different points. So that's what I mean. Um, programming can be simpler too. So proofs can be simpler, but programming can be simpler too, since the proofs sort of guide program construction. Um, for instance, you know, you may know that in in uh, in some cases of your program, because of the invariants that you're writing, that certain unreachable cases can be can just be ignored, and you don't even have to write them, rather than trying to write and write. Uh, and, and you know, develop sort of uh, notoriously error-prone um, uh, and buggy kind of error handling code for cases that may never arise in practice. Um, and um, and and then I think programs can also be more daring in a, in a sense. You, the the invariants that you're writing help justify optimizations that may be too risky to attempt otherwise. So um, and I think this 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 spirit that this last bit I think is also. Um, um, uh, a, um, a kind of a, a slogan that's echoed in, in many other languages these days, notably in Rust, this kind of hack without fear mentality where, you know, uh, the, the, the system, the type system that you're, you're working in has, has got your back. So you can try out things and um, the, the machine is going to ensure that you don't, you don't make a mistake. So, um, so what is, so what is F star then? So uh, the way I see it is that F star is a, a framework for proof oriented programming and it has a number of elements in it. The first is that it's a functional programming language with effects. 
So it's not a, what I mean is that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not just a, a, a pure programming language. It, it has a pure fragment, but it also has effects. So in that sense, it's like OCaml or F Sharp or Haskell. And, um, and F star programs are extracted by default to uh, OCaml or F Sharp. So you write an F star program, you do a proof about it, and you want to execute it. Well, you can uh, ask F star to give you, um, uh, to translate that program to OCaml or F Sharp for execution. Various subsets, and we design these kind of domain-specific subsets of F star to enable other kinds of compilation backends. And we have some subsets that allow you to compile F star to efficient C code or even to WebAssembly. Um, uh, by efficiency code, I mean you run F star verified F star programs in C without a you know with with manual memory management dealing with malloc and free. There's no without without any particular runtime, so you really get you know low level imperative code uh, out of some subsets of F star. And the the these subsets that produce C code is are the ones that we really deploy widely. Um, uh, you know, in the middle of the Windows kernel. Uh, we typically are writing F star code and extracting C code and running and deploying the C code that comes out of F star. It's also a semi-automated program verifier using automated theorem proving tools. And in that, in this sense, it's a, it's it resembles tools like Daphne or Pharmacy or, or Y3 and so on, uh, where you write a, a program and this produces a number of proof obligations, and those proof obligations are sent to an SMT solver for automated proving. Um, it's got an expressive core language, um, and a core language of, of, of um, uh, dependently typed total functions, and it's based on a dependent type theory very similar to the type theories of, uh, of other dependently typed proof systems like, like Koch and, and Lean and Agda and Idris. But actually, it's, it's an extensional variant of type theory. In that sense, it's maybe cl most closely related to Nubro. Um, uh, it's got a, a meta programming and a uh, tactic framework for uh, to do interactive proofs um, uh, and also to sort of generate programs. Oh, that's a question from, from Mohit. Mohit, please go ahead. Oh, hi, Nikhil. Uh, so uh, my question is that, uh, like you, you mentioned that F star has a semi-automated program verifier uh, like Pharmacy and Y3. So uh, suppose that we are trying to, uh, I mean, verify a module which has a complex specification and the automated theorem proving like uh, it fails in, in in that case. So would is there any way to uh, go back and prove interactively using uh, from F star like using yes. Coq or any other interactive proof assistant? Yes, there is. So um, you know if you. Um, uh, I mean, you have to be um, uh, you have to be sort of you have to set it up in the right way. But uh, often, what we do is we say, you know, you write a program, and the, the default um, uh, mechanism to prove the program is to try to prove it using the SMT solver. But the SMT solver is, in a way, is just one of a suite of tactics available in F star. So if it fails to prove using the SMT solver, you can say, okay, this particular proof goal, I'm going to trap this goal using a tactic. And, um, and to start manipulating the goal man manually and trying to do proofs about it using, um, you know, uh, do, doing it by hand, by using, for instance, uh, a number of proof techniques. And you will see some of these during this course, right? You, uh, you know, you can do proofs by normalization or proofs by reflection or proofs by, you know, sort of just video game tactic mode and just, you know, bang through a proof. So yes, this, the short answer to your question is yes. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Juan, is that a question? Juan? Yeah. Hi, Nico. Um, so can you hear me, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in software development, more agile, develop, the agile development, there's something called test-driven development, uh -huh. where we write tests first and then we code. And can we say the proof oriented programming is something similar, but it's a more in a functional programming, the type of uh, development? Um, uh, yes, I, I, um, I think it's not so much functional programming as uh, I think it uh, 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 functional programming, I think the way uh, it, dep it depends on what one thinks of as functional programming. I, I think of functional programming as the ability to abstract and to speak about um, to, to work in an abstraction that is suitable for your program, whether that be pure functions or whether it be some other structures. 
Um, and um, uh, so I think when I when I uh, when I'm speaking about proof oriented programming, it's it's really I, I, what I mean is uh, it's uh, working in an abstraction that is suitable for any, allowing you to state and prove properties of interest about your program to prove them mathematically rather than to prove them by um, I, I don't know rather than to validate them by some other means like tests and it's I think complementary to other things like I think you should still do test driven development tests are invaluable and you should still do that develop your program write a bunch of unit tests and, and make sure that it's actually working correctly in concretely in that sense but uh, you should augment this with um, in, in domains where where it is uh, um, I'm also quite pragmatic about this, by the way. I don't think proof-oriented programming should be applied everywhere. Proofs are expensive and difficult to develop. And you know there are pieces of code where it's maybe not cost-effective to develop proofs for them. But there are specific domains in which the, uh, the cost of an error at runtime is sufficiently large that it makes it worthwhile to actually do a, to, to, to sort of uh, you know, uh, do an, uh, an expensive in the sense of human effort proof upfront to um, um, to exclude these kinds of critical runtime errors. And in such domains, augmenting whatever your existing development, development methodology is with this mindset of co-developing programs and proofs, I think is important. Thank you. Uh, Karuna, is that a question? Yeah, so I'm relaying a question from one of our fellow um, audience members. The question goes as follows. So you just described that there's a subset of F star that, that can be compiled to low level C or WebAssembly code. Um, so they're trying to ask whether that translation goes through some sort of a verified compiler. Are there certain guarantees that we get out of the C code that is emitted out of this process? It's a good question. Um, so um, the, the the main subset that we have that compiles from F star to C is a, um, and I'm gonna tell you about this during the course, it's a, it's a subset of F star that we call low star. And it's got, it's meant to be an embedding in, uh, a shallow embedding in, of a subset of C in F star. This is formalized in a, in a paper that we had at ICFP 17, uh, describing, uh, and, and we, we show there, on paper, that um, there's a manual proof that shows that the uh, this translation from the subset of F star to uh, one of the internal languages of Comstock C Lite is um, is a simulation. So it, at least on, on with a with a with a manual uh, proof that that's that's the guarantee that you get uh, about our translation. Now, concretely, this translation is implemented by a tool. Uh, called Kremlin, which is which, and that tool does not have a me mechanically checked proof associated with it. So, um, uh, so you have to trust um, this Kremlin compiler that this 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 Kremlin compiler actually implements what we formalize on paper. There are other subsets of, uh, subsets of S star. For instance, we have a um, and we have a, a subset of S star that's a deep embedding of assembly language x86, or you know you can choose what assembly language you want. We use x86. Uh, um, uh, that one, for instance, we we literally verify the assembly code that we print, and um, so uh, it depends on the setup. But uh, but for the C compiler, yes, you have to trust Kremlin. I see. That clarifies it. Thanks a lot. Hannah, is that a question? Uh, yes. Thank you for taking my question. So um, you kind of partially answered it uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, it's about like uh, where the use, like some of the use cases where interactive proofs are more applicable uh, than the automated proofs. Uh, and uh, so speaking of interactive proofs, uh, the code development of the proofs and programs, uh, usually we want to, like you said, it's uh, we want to make like the programs burden less. So we try to make the program, it could be easier and so is proofs, uh, but uh, I, I still uh, had some experience with it, like for writing in order to do the interactive proofs, uh, it's easier when you write the uh, program that uh, fit the environment, you know, like the in environments pretty well so that your proofs are, like your proof obligations uh, immediately reduces. Um, but still like, 
you either so it requires some I feel some cleverness for you to design the program in a certain way, right? So I feel it's either you push it to the program uh, or the proof side. Uh, I I don't uh, have a concrete example how you could make both uh, easier. Yeah, it, it, this definitely requires cleverness on on both sides. Uh, I don't think there's like a a, a sort of a um, a single recipe that sort of uh, you know um, uh, that you can apply everywhere. Um, uh, but um, I think what I meant to say was that there are synergies that you can exploit on both sides. It doesn't necessarily mean that both sides become simpler, but there are things that you can exploit in some places that that. Um, that in, in some cases at the cost of maybe um, you know, designing your program in a slightly trickier way than you might do at, uh, you know, uh, naturally, you make your proofs much simpler. And the, 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 I think the end game is to ensure that this ratio is as small as possible. And that may involve, some, in some cases, writing more code, concrete code. In some cases, it may involve writing uh, uh, more proof at the expense of writing less code. But the, I think my goal is overall to reduce that ratio. Oh, I see. So do you think like uh, if we have that scenario and do you think turning into turning the interactive proof into some uh, or translating to the uh, program that'll do uh, automatic proof for us will be somewhat easier or that's not usually the case? It depends. In some cases, you can extract a program from, from a proof, but um, in, uh, in other cases, given a program, you can find a proof automatically, but it really depends on the domain. I see. That makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, right. So uh, I, I hope I answered all the all the questions. I, I, I don't see any more hands up. But um, uh, so uh, so using all this the, this framework, we we um, we define several domain specific languages in F star for various programming and proving tasks. And we define for those languages uh, different logics in which to prove programs correct about them, often variants of four logics. Um, and, um, and the overall landscape um, that I'm going to cover or try to cover during this, this course is uh, looks something like this. There's, there's F star at the center, which is this proof assistant and, and programming language. Um, and within it, we, uh, we, emit, we embed several languages. So, um, I think the first one I'm going to tell you about is Veil, which is a deep embedding of an assembly language in F star. And you write programs in Veil, and it goes through F star and gets verified and comes out as x86 assembly. Um, the next one I'm going to tell you about is Lowstar, which I've mentioned a little bit about. It's a subset of F star that compiles to C and also to WebAssembly. Everparse, actually, I should have shown the picture slightly differently. Everparse is a, is a verified parser generator layered on top of Lowstar, and it's uh, so go, Everparse is a combinator library built on top of Lowstar that lets you sort of this I'm kind of you know it lets you sort of stack DSLs in some sense. You you, you build a tower of abstractions and Everparse is kind of on top of Lowstar and it also produces C code. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about Steel, which is some of our most recent work, which is showing how you can embed concurrency and distribution and so on inside FStar and reason about programs in a separation logic uh, um, designed in conjunction with Steel. Um, so, um, as an outline of this course today, I'm just going to be introducing F star and um, we'll, I think probably I'll do uh, one demo this uh, um, of basic functional programming and then maybe if I have time I'll do a little bit about just to get you guys familiar with F star syntax, um, um, something like a simply type lambda calculus. Um, and then well, I'm not going to go into. The, I'm going to try to move on. You can see these slides are online. I've posted a link on the on the Slack, um, so you can you can see the outline of the course. Um, I also posted instructions on Slack about uh, how to install F star. A lot of what I'm going to do is is um, kind of have F star in a in a Emacs buffer and uh, step through code and proof. So I think it'll be productive if. Um, you all have F star installed and can also follow along as I do my uh, coding developments. Karuna, is that another question? Uh, 
Um, yes, we do have a few more questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, the first one says, how are tactics actually implemented in FSTAR? Do they have any resemblance to um, how implementation looks like in Cork or in Lean? Um, yeah, they're inspired a lot by how they implemented in Lean and in Idris. It's a, there's a meta programming framework in FSTAR and, and tactics are an instance of a meta program. And, um, um, right. And I have another question as well. It says, is Everparse also a parse combinator? Is Everparse a parser? Everparse is a library of parser combinators. Yes. I see. Parser and um, serializer combinators, actually. But yes. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, there's one more question before we start with it. That, that's, that's something that that's just specific to me. I'm wondering, you just uh, described about the various DSLs that are implemented and are available as a fronted on top of the FSTARS program logic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering what, what, um, what is the main importance of having all these DSLs tweaked according to the different sort of proof uh, scenarios that these yeah. DSLs can be equipped for? Um, like, since, why, since why, do we, why do we bother to have all these DSLs? In, in a, right. Why do we have to have a specific DSL mm -hmm. customized for the parsing related scenarios, the, another one for concurrency related thing? I was wondering, why didn't everything just get, just get combined into the, uh, this middle layer, which is the logical foundations for the F star itself? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So, um, you should see FSTAR as a, a framework in which you can sort of state, you know, make statements about essentially like arbitrary mathematics. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, within that framework, you, you know, you're, you're interested in say, you know, uh, uh, let's say I'm interested in assembly programs. Um, the way I'm in, in which I'm going to use FSTAR to prove assembly programs is, well, you know, uh, if I'm just, if I were to write it directly in F star, then um, I mean, an arbitrary F star program may involve things that cannot naturally be translated into assembly. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, here's this fragment, like maybe here's the syntax of an assembly language. And this is the only things that are allowed in assembly, things like moving stuff between registers or primitive instructions to add, um, num add you know, bounded integers, things like this. And I'm going to force myself to write programs in just this fragment. And that fragment I'm going to call veil. And, I'm, and I want a way to do, and I'm going to give a semantics to this fragment. I'm going to say, here's for these instructions, this is what it means mathematically for these programs to execute. I'm going to have a model of what a machine is. And I'm going to have a model of what it means to run a sequence of assembly instructions on that machine. And that model is going to just be stated using you know, arbitrary math in FSTAR. That model is not meant to be executable because I'm eventually I'm going to execute my program on a concrete machine. But I have a model of what the machine is and I'm gonna do my proofs about these little assembly programs against my model. And, um, and I'm going to define a logic, a, a specialized set of proof rules that are derived from F star's logic. The, the, their soundness is, the, you know, is proven in F star's logic. And I'm going to use those proof rules to prove something about my assembly program that are these derived rules rather than just, you know, um, uh, just uh, kind of uh, uh, saying, you know, to the user, uh, you know, one, one way to do it is say, well, here's the semantics, user, go ahead, prove whatever you can in FSTAR about it. But to do proofs in that style is very, um, I don't know, it's very, you want structure. So you typically de derive, a, build a logic that has certain structure specialized to doing such proofs. And um, that's why we embed these, these different logics inside FSTAR. I see that 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 clarifies it. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. That's great. Uh, uh, so the these installation instructions up here. I see some of you had some success using it in um, on on the Slack uh, uh, on the uh, OPLSS Slack. That's great. Uh, if you're interested in FSTAR and have questions about it and about Everest in general, then I recommend you join. Um, this other Slack instance that there's plenty of FSTAR experts and uh, people developing crypto code and parsers and so on hanging out uh, over there. And um, uh, it's a great place to ask questions and get feedback and 
um, and so on. Um, um, yeah, and let me know if you have trouble installing things. Um, you should also, I would recommend, maybe maybe not all of you are comfortable using Emacs, but um, F-star in Emacs is kind of the way that most people who are using F-star seriously use F-star. Uh, so there's this Emacs mode and um, uh, I encourage you to use it too, if, you, if you're comfortable with that. Uh, oh, I should have said, there's also an online version of F-star at that URL that you can, um, that you can run. It's good for, for small experiments, but not for anything too serious. Um, but maybe okay for this course, or at least for some parts of this course. Uh, there's several links up there for other resources to learn about F-star. And um, I'm gonna start today with um, just a, a, a tour of some basic things in F-star. So, so some basic types. So, um, so the, the general game in F-star is that you that a type is an abstraction of your program's runtime behavior. It describes kind of what values in some sense your program may compute. And um, you can define things like the empty type, the type that has no values is, um, is, is one such type. Um, there's a type that has exactly one value and that's the type called unit. The Boolean is, a, is, is, a, is also a type. It's the type that has exactly two values and you can keep kind of playing this game and uh, uh, defining new types. Uh, that restrict the class of values that your programs may compute. Um, uh, I'm assuming, in at least at the last OPLSS that I, I was at, I asked a question about, um, you know, um, how many of you are comfortable programming in some functional programming language? And uh, most were, and I'm wondering if that's true this time. Like, uh, um, is there a way to do a quick poll? I'm not sure how people can... I can do a quick, you know, raise your hands poll, but um, uh, I hope most of you are comfortable using functional programming languages, um, whether they are, uh, um, you know, things like OCaml or Haskell or, uh, but also maybe, you know, Racket and Scheme and those sorts of things. So I'm assuming there's a basic familiarity with functional programming. This may not be true across the board. Um, so if you're not familiar with syntax, uh, please ask me and I'll try to explain on the fly. Um, looks like I see lots of hands going up. That's, that's good. Um, uh, so you can define, you know, basic inductive types, like that's the type of lists in F star. A list is just that is defined by cases. There's either the empty list or a cons. It's like a linked list. It's got a head element and a tail element. And that's, also, that's an inductive way to build a list, but actually, Inductive types in F-star are not just simple data types like in, um, like in say, OCaml. You can define more like in Coq or Nagda and so on. You can define uh, indexed inductive type families where you know, here's the type of a, of a red black tree, for instance, indexed both by it, the, the depth of the tree and the color of each node. Um, you can define recursive functions. Um, and here's what factorial looks like in F star. That's hopefully fairly natural if you're coming from other functional languages. Um, it's a recursive function on integers, returning an integer defined by case analysis on the integer with the recursive call right there. Um, it's higher order. Um, so you can define functions like maps and, and have lambdas. And if you, if you map the function of lambda fun x, I often pronounce fun as lambda. So it's, um, if I, if I call map passing in an, an anon, anonymous function, a lambda that maps x to x plus 42, and I run it on one, two, three, this reduces to um, the list with each element incremented. And then you have refinement types. And this is where, you know, maybe things are getting a little kind of spe uh, F star specific. So um, and the type nat, for instance, the type of natural numbers in F star is defined as the type of integers x such that they validate this predicate that X is at least zero. So that's one way to define that in, in F star. Um, so in one informal mental model with these refinement types is that you can use these refinements to kind of use a type to describe a, a set of values. Now, for various reasons, like a model of types as sets is, is inaccurate for, 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 for various reasons, but it's a useful mental model to, to keep in mind. So you can define um, things like um, you know, the empty type is the, is the type that has the false uh, refinement. 
And you can define types that contain, you know, just the even numbers or types that's, so for instance, the even numbers are the integers x such that x mod two equals zero. That's the type of even numbers. Or the type of just exactly zero, uh, that's also a type, the type of integers such that uh, integers x such that x is exactly zero. Question, is that, are those questions? Uh, or are they still hands up for uh, functional programming questions? I don't know, Will, do you have a question? No. Okay. I think most of them are actually raised hands from the previous question, okay. but there right. are indeed a few questions from the audience. Um, let me know if you would be glad to take them. Yeah, right yeah, yeah happy to take um, them. Sure thing. So the first one um, says that, is it possible to define two types referencing each other in F star similar to Agda? Mutually uh, types, yes, it's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, another one says, is int in um, F star represented as a bit vector? Uh, no, int is not represented as a bit vector. So int is represented as a, uh, uh, in uh, depending on how you compile it. So if you compile it to a camel, int is a zeroth integer. It's a, it's a big int. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think. I think you would be discussing about subtyping later on, right? Yes. Because there are questions mm -hmm. related to that. Yeah. Uh, we could take it up later then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so another question. So if int was uh, uh, was compiled differently onto different languages, how do you prove property about int? So, um, uh, so for uh, for OCaml, it's compiled to zero, and that's our kind of reference semantics. When you're compiling to C. We do not compile bigger to, uh, a big int to C. What we do is we compile, we, we then define a, a, a machine integers. We have libraries that say, you know, I have um, uint64 or uint32 and so on. We have libraries for this. And these libraries are, they are given a model built on um, this mathematical notion of integer that's big int. And, um, and then if you program against these abstract types that give you uint32, our compiler to C will extract UN32 to, um, to C's type UN32. Okay, so int just um, uh, models a um, modular arithmetic. Again. No, int models, uh, int is mathematical integer. It, mo it models, uh, you know, unbounded infinite precision arithmetic on integers. Okay, cool, thank you. So, so what happens when you program with these refinement types is if you, if you say, here's, here's a type of factorial. Factorial, earlier I said it was a, a function from ints to ints, but it's really a function from nats to nats. So if, uh, and F star can prove this by saying, well, uh, if I claim it has, uh, its argument is type nat, and it's, then its result type it's nat, is nat, what F star does is, is it, it's going to analyze this piece of code and produce proof obligations, in this case, which will be discharged by SMT to show that this, Piece of code really has type nat, so that will uh, uh, turn into a, a a case analysis. There's one case analysis here where this is easy to prove that one is a nat. That's the easy case, um, but this is the more slightly more interesting case. And here we have to prove first that in this recursive call, that n minus if n is a nat, then n minus one is also a nat. Well, that's not true if n is zero, but we've excluded the case where n is zero, so we know that if n is not zero then n minus one is a nat. And so that allows us to make this recursive call. Um, and uh, having made that recursive call, we get back a nat. We know that n is a nat. So a nat times a nat is going to be a nat. And that's another proof obligation that comes up and uh, uh, which the SMT solver is able to prove. So refinements, and this is maybe a question about sub, maybe helps address the question about subtyping. Refinements are eliminated by subtyping. So if I have a, um, you know, if I apply factorial to 42, it has type nat, but I can treat it as if it had type int because I can just forget the refinement. Um, and uh, I can also um, use subtyping you know, within, a, within a, uh, an arrow type, uh, you know, contravariantly on the argument and covariantly on the result sort of turning factorial into this, giving it this other type, which is restricting its domain and uh, to just the positive numbers and kind of widening its co-domain to 
to return any integer rather than just nats. And so subtyping kind of works together with refinements. Uh, on a similar note, I would like to interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Uh, one of our friend is curious, if we put refinements on already refined types, then will those refinements stack be resolved eagerly? That is, will it become false if they are unsatisfiable? Um, right, that's the question. So, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. So you can certainly um, add I refinements to existing refined types. Yes. I think it would be um, nice of Claire to step in and maybe uh, clarify it for yourself. Um, uh, uh, I think meanwhile, if, if that's not possible, then we could step yes. in. Yes, uh, uh, can I say something? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so my question is if we have a multiple uh, refinement, right? The x is bigger than zero and x is smaller than zero, then will it be reserved eagerly so that it becomes a first, like, uh, because we, it is unsatisfiable? So, uh, so you can define a type. So, so uh, if you define if you if you define a type like the one you described, um, uh, x colon n, such that first x is greater than zero, and then another refinement saying that it's less than zero, that is equivalent to this type, the first yeah, type. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and you can prove that it's equivalent to that in XR. Uh, I mean the the internal representation will be like it will will it handle all those two or will it will it uh, resolve it and uh, replace it with false? Or it will not replace it with false. Those two okay. are syntactically yeah. different, but they are provably equal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. So. Um, the fu function types in FSTAR are also dependent. So that, for instance, a type for the increment function is uh, is this one. It says, one type for it says that if you give me an integer x, I will give you an integer y such that x is less than y. But there are many possible such types for, for integer, for increment. Here's a very precise one. It says, if you give me an a, 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 uh, argument x, I will give you an argument, a result y such that y is exactly x plus one. And, you know, um, uh, you can write many other such types for increment. Um, uh, I should say one, uh, a, a quick word about termination. So it, when you're in this total fragment of star, ensuring that it, when I say total, what I mean is that it's, um, it's the, these are pure terminating functions. They have no side effect and they always return uh, in some finite amount of time with the result. So it's really important in F star for these total functions to actually be terminating and for them to result to, to, to actually be total. So, um, uh, so F star has a termination check. So whenever you define a total function, it's going to prove uh, and force you to prove that it in fact terminates. So if I try to define factorial at this type in tar int, F star would refuse it because um, if I called factorial with minus one, for instance, it would loop forever. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, it turns out the way F star does termination checks is based on an, a well-founded ordering on expressions. And um, this includes the, uh, at, at the core of it is there's a, a subterm ordering on inductive types. Um, uh, it also it allows for a, um, a natural numbers to be related by the less than ordering on, on natural numbers. And from this, it's, you can also prove in F star that other orderings are well-founded. For instance, that the lexicographic ordering on on pairs is well-founded. And F-star provides some special support for that. Um, uh, that allows you to do proofs like this for, or define functions like this. So for instance, the Ackerman function is a, is a classic function that illustrates you know, why um, lexicographic orderings are important. So um, this function terminates, Ackerman M of N, MN terminates because um, at each recursive call, either M decreases or M stays the same and N decreases. And both of these are nats. So they both, uh, so this, this ordering uh, has no infinite descending chains. So uh, F star is aware of this and, and will prove and force you to prove that uh, um, functions like this terminate. Uh, in fact, often you don't have to write this, this decreases annotation is the explanation to F star for why this thing terminates. 
that is decreasing according to this lexicographic ordering. But SDART has a bunch of defaults built in so that um, it turns out that the by default, it's going to pick the lexicographic ordering of all the arguments in order. So uh, you often don't have to write this decreases clause. Um, uh, SDART has a built in. Yeah, go ahead. While we're talking about uh, non termination, there was an interesting question about modeling floats and real numbers in F star and how how does that work? Thanks. Yeah, um, we don't actually. We have we we don't. Uh, the the only model of reals in F star is the SMT solver that we use has a theory of reals, and uh, we expose that in F star as a, an abstract type called real, and you can reason using the SMT solver with reals. And um, that's all we have at this point. We do not model floats in F star. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry if I if you answered this earlier and I didn't catch it, but um, um, how do you decide uh, that one refinement type is a subtype of another? Right. Um, uh, good question. So um, let's go back to that. So uh, I wish I had a little whiteboard on which to write right now, but um, or maybe I do. Let me, let me do that. So um, if I have a, a refinement type uh, P and I want to define, decide if it's a refinement of um, um, The, the rule for this looks something like, okay, it's all in a context. Then um, the rule for this is that I first need to prove that um, T is a subtype of T prime, that their base types are related. And then I need to prove that if in a context where I can assume that X has type T, can I prove and I'm going to use a different judgment here. This is a judgment for sort of a logical entailment. Can I prove that, uh, I hope I get the polarities right. Can I prove that P implies Q? Then if I can prove these two things, then it's safe for me to treat any, any value of type uh, on the, the type on the left as if it had the type on the right. Does that answer your question? I see. Um, so, um... So, but I'm, I suppose I'm just uh, more curious about the underlying mechanism uh, which you implement this. Uh, do right. you kind of prove P implies Q using like an SMT solver or? Yeah, yeah. so this, this judgment here, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this, this judgment, the one with the, the double turn style, that in effect is decided by SMT or by default by SMT, but you could also handle this using a tactic. I see, thank you. Um, okay. That, so, um, so you can, one way to prove things about programs is to give them a certain kind of enriched types. But another way to prove things about a program is, is that you define your program uh, up front um, and, um, and then you, you can write lemmas about your program. And a lemma is a, a, a total function whose type describes some properties about other terms that are in scope. So for instance, if I have length and append defined this way, I can define a, a, a set, another function, which I'm gonna call append length, which says that if you give me two lists, x's and y's, I'm going to, this thing is a lemma. So a lemma, you should see it as a sugar for a unit refined by some property. Lemma P is unit refined by some property. Instead of writing unit refined with P, it's a little clumsy to write that. So we just write lemma. And, um, and this says, this is, this is a, a program whose type tells me that it's a total function that whenever you apply it to X's and Y's, it's, it's going to return a, a, uh, uh, in a context where this property is provable, namely that the length of the append of these two lists is the sum of their individual lengths. And that, that, uh, that thing is, is, you can do this proof by induction and uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's establishing the property about these two other two functions, length and append that are in scope. So we, do, we use these lemmas a lot. 
and you're going to see me writing many of them. Um, I see there are questions up. Um, I'm trying to get to a demo, and I'm, if there, uh, so I'm going to wait till the end on these questions because I, I'd like to um, uh, quickly reach the point where I can start a demo, and then you can ask these questions. So bear with me for a second. So you can write lemmas about about many different things. So if I write up, for instance, a a a uh, a function to um, reverse a list. Uh, and I want to prove, for instance, that the uh, that reverse is involutive. If I apply reverse twice, I get back the list I started with. You can write lemmas that invoke other lemmas. So for instance, to prove this lemma, I need a auxiliary auxiliary lemma that says if I if I reverse um, a list with one element added to the end, h, then what I get is h whose tail is the reverse of the list at the start. And so you can, you can kind of build these several lemmas and to uh, establish, uh, to work towards the property that you want. And if you follow the online tutorial, so there's a link in my slides to an online tutorial, which I encourage you to try. It's going to work you through, I think it's about six chapters or so, but at the end of the sixth chapter, you will end with being able to hopefully uh, write and prove quick sort correct. And a type for quick sort would look something like this, that if I'm given a total order on some element types A and a list of those elements, then quick sort is going to return to me some other list M that is sorted with respect to this total order and is a permutation of the input list. And you can write such a thing and prove it correct in F star. And if you work through the tutorial, I think you'll get there. So um, when I switch to a demo, maybe uh, if you have a question, you can ask it now. Yeah, there was a question about how different is a is the NAT type from the NAT um, annotated with the total description before that. Basically, total NAT and NAT. How, how are these two things different? Ah, these two things are are they are they are just synonyms. So I, I'll okay. show you that in in a in a second. So I can I can so here it is. Here's NAT. Uh, here's factorial whose result, result type is NAT. I could have also mm -hmm. written that. And it's just a synonym. And as, as you'll see later in the course, um, we will use different effects here. For instance, in, in some cases, we may write here, uh, this, this may have state effect, and then the annotation matters. But tote is the default annotation, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I see. Uh, there's another question that asks about the comparison of the SMT performance uh, when it's it's combined with refinement types versus the dependent types. Is there any noticeable difference how SMT solver might uh, perform? So I think the, the, uh, there's no particular difference between using refinements and other forms of uh, extra type system dependencies and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. I think where SMT solver performance matters is it depends on what theories you're using from the SMT solver. For instance, if you're trying to get the SMT solver to prove things about uh, nonlinear arithmetic, um, it's you have to hold its hand quite carefully and, and structure your proof with several lemmas along the way. Um, so it depends on what theories you're using in the SMT solver rather than what syntactic constructs you're using in the F-star program. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, one last question, if we still have time. How are the logical obligations which are eventually sought to be discharged by the SMT solver um, put together with the compiler, like where does that plumbing actually happen? The, the, the results of the obligations coming from the SMT solver and the F stars compiler. Yeah, I think this is, this is, a, this is a long answer. So I'm gonna skip this one. And uh, you know, we can chat about it on, 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 on Slack, for instance. Sure thing. Uh, so I have, ten, I have 10 minutes. I'm gonna try to get through this demo um, and, uh, and so, so here's, here's NAT, that's the type I showed you earlier. Um, this is F-star running in Emacs. Uh, uh, that's factorial, which I also showed you earlier. Now, if I wanted to do a proof about, uh, let's say the fact that factorial is increasing, that say, you know, if I apply factorial to a, a NAT, I get back that, that for any NAT, factorial of N is greater than or equal to N. I can do a proof about it this way by writing another recursive function. So, so what I do is I, I, I uh, move my cursor to a point and I, writ, and I hit control C enter, which feeds the next chunk of code to F star in this interactive mode. And this thing is a proof by an induction that says, 
Well, if n is less than two, then I'm not really gonna write a proof at all. Let the SMP solver find the proof automatically in this case. I'm supposed to return a unit, so I return unit, but I need to prove this refinement and F star at this point will prove that unit in this context is a subtype of unit with this property, factorial of n is greater than n by using that, uh, by using that judgment that I sketched earlier. Um, in the, if n is not, uh, uh, if n is greater than or equal to three, then I, I recursively call the function on n minus one. That's like using the induction hypothesis. And that's enough to provide enough facts in my context that the SMT solver can finish the rest. Okay, so uh, now instead of writing this unit with factorial of n, uh, writing it in this notation, it's a little cleaner and more idiomatic in F-star to write it with this notation that says, that uses lemma rather than a unit refinement. Uh, by the way, I'm, I hope I'm not already over time. I was expecting to run till 10.30, is that right? That's Okay, uh, Nikhil, yeah, just finish when, uh, since we start late, so okay. uh, please continue, yes. Okay, sorry, I, I, I just realized that maybe I was supposed to stop at 10.20, but I'll, I'll, I'll finish up quickly. Uh, uh, so these, these, uh, 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 the, this bit of sugar can also extends to, you know, you can write uh, lemmas with, uh, a precondition and a postcondition. So th this factorial increasing lemma prime is, is equivalent to the one I wrote before, where I've taken the nat that was in the type of the argument. Uh, I've made the type just an integer, but I've um, uh, I uh, moved the refinement into the precondition. And uh, so that, that's equivalent uh, to, to, to the previous one. So um, F star also has polymorphism like in, in many other um, languages. In, in F star, it's just a special case of, of dependent types. So here, here's the identity, polymorphic identity function in F star. It says uh, this pound A is notation in F star to say that this argument is implicit. I'm not going to write this argument when I, when I use ID. So for instance, I can say um, ID of zero, and I didn't write, I didn't write the argument uh, I didn't instantiate the argument A. F star figured out what it should be for um, uh, using type inference. Um, and I could have also written, you know, um, and it will figure out uh, that instantiation too. Right, okay. Um, so these, this is um, uh, the, the map which I showed, showed you earlier, which is a, a, a polymorphic uh, higher order map over uh, a list. Um, and now here we see something interesting. You can use an assert in F star to, to check that some property is true at compile time. So unlike in some other languages where asserts are evaluated at dynamically at runtime, in F star assert is a static assertion. It's gonna check before you compile your program that this property is true. So here I assert that if I map the incrementing function over one, two, three, I get two, three, four. And this property is, F star is gonna check it in this case by the SMT solver and is able to prove it. But now there are limits to this. So for instance, the SMT solver isn't great at doing computation over large terms. So for instance, if I, uh, um, uh, if I ask F star to prove this, it's going to fail. And this expect failure annotation, if I, it, it's telling F star that, yeah, this, this one is really expected to fail because, um, but if I, if I remove it, F star is gonna complain here saying the SMT solver could not prove this particular query. And it's because F star limits the number of unrollings that an SMT solver is, that the SMT solver is allowed to do on recursive functions. And in this case, it has to do 10 unrollings and F star doesn't allow it to do that unless you change some settings. Um, so there are limits to what you can do with the SMT solver, but F star gives you other ways to, to get to work around this when the SMT solver can't do certain proofs. So one way to do it is by using the F star normalizer. So like any dependently typed language, F star has within it an abstract machine that can reduce, can, can compute with F star terms. And here, this assert norm is a keyword in F star uh, that, that tells F star to prove this assertion using the normalizer rather than using the SMP solver. And in this case, the normalizer can prove this easily by just computing and it, it's, the proof is instant. Um, um, you can also do such a proof by a tactic. And here's how you can use a one simple case of using a tactic in F star. This particular goal, um, you can trap it and you can say, prove this goal by, and here's a tactic and a little F star script that is, um, that's going to prove this particular goal. And it's th this particular script, what it's gonna do is it says, 
first normalize both sides, reduce both sides using these, this reduction strategy. I'm not going to say too much about what it is. Some of you may kind of deduce what it is. And, um, and then after you've reduced both sides, prove them equal by reflexivity, and then check that we're done with all goals. And so this is like a, a, one of your, like perhaps the simplest tactic, one of the simplest tactics you can write um, to discharge a single goal. Um, now, uh, types in F-star, was that a question so far, by the way? Questions about the demo so far? Um, yeah, there's a question asking if there's there's an option to see um, undischarged goals, just like we see in proof general inside Coq and the Emacs. Buffer. There is there is with a tactic you can you can uh, you can do that. It's um, uh, you know at any point in a tactic you can say, for instance, tell me what my goals are. Um, so you can dump it and say, I don't know, give it a tag. Say my goals. And Astra will tell you that at this point, that's what the goal is. Oh, nice. That's good. Um, uh, so you can, you know, you can see that my, in, initially my goal was like this. Uh, but after having, you know, I, the way you usually do this is after, say, after norm. Um, that's how my goal looked like after normalization. The once both sides are reduced, then this side, and then I have reflexivity. I can finish. Oh, um, do you need to give a hook or a target after which you want to see the dump of all the goals, or um, how is there, it? There are other ways you can do this. Um, there are other options you can trigger to see goals at different depths, but um, uh, I'm, sure. there are ways to do it. I'm not going to cover it right now. Um, Um, so I have, let me go quickly. I have another five minutes, I think, uh, or even two. So, uh, so um, types in F star can, can be computed from any, any pure expression over types. So, uh, so for instance, here's a function which branches on a Boolean and returns in one case a string and in another case an int. This is often ill-typed in most languages, in most non-dependently typed languages. But in F star, this program has a type and it's the result type of this function is a case analysis on the argument Boolean. So it says, if I'm called with, a, with true, then I return a string, otherwise I return an int. And this is fine in F star. Now this program is a little bit artificial, but um, you know things like printf uh, in, in other languages are defined as a library in F star that allows the, the, uh, the type of the arguments that follow the format string are uh, computed from the format string itself. So here, you know, I can apply sprintf to two different argument, two different format strings, and give it uh, two different results, uh, two different sets of arguments. Uh, and you know, you can um, you can ask F star to even uh, compute um, the result of say message prime, and it's going to reduce that term and tell you what it computed. It's hello OPSS 2021. Um, uh, this you can also do sort of index types. Here's a, here's vector. Uh, the vector type is like a like a list, but its index is going to tell you the length of the list. So here's vector a uh, zero is the nil case. And in the cons case, if you give me a if you add a head element to a vector whose length is n, you get a vector whose length is n plus one. Uh, and uh, you can uh, you know you can use uh, you can define um, functions over vectors. So for instance, if I'm going to write to take the head element of a vector. I need to know that the vector at least has one element in it. And I'm going to do that by constraining its length to be greater than zero. And if so, I know I can exclude the nil case because the nil has has length zero and project out the head element. And star is okay with that. Uh, so here are some uh, some basic functions on vectors, like uh, getting the nth element of a vector and so on. Appending uh, sorry, appending two vectors tells me that its action on the indexes is to sum the indexes. And um, the type tells you that. So that's pretty much what I had in this demo. I think if you uh, work towards the end of it, there's an exercise at the end of it which says, well, maybe you could try to define, um, instead of defining vector the way that I did over there, could you define vector or an, a different kind of vector, a, a refined list, an L list, A, N, 
such that uh, it's defined as a list whose length is n. And using that representation, can you define um, some of these functions that I have here on vectors? So um, if you start reading the tutorial and you uh, try out some examples there, there's many small examples there that you can try. Um, um, you may work yourself um, to a point where you could attempt doing uh, a tutorial, uh, these exercises on, on vectors as well. So um, I'll stop there for now. And um, if you have some, if you have time for qu more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and thank you for all the questions so far. Hi, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the, according to the subtyping rule you, you presented, I think it's not possible to reordering the refinement conditions, right? When we have a type one, which is int with a refinement one and type two, which is a int with refinement two, then mm -hmm. It's not possible. Is is it po possible to prove the subtyping relationship between a relation between the type one with refinement two and type two with refinement one, like the thing I typed in the chat? Just a moment. Something like this. Sorry, I haven't seen the chat. Okay. Um... Ah, can you prove that? So, um, so uh, when you reorder the requirements, like um, applying one first and then two, and two first and then one. So F star will will um, uh, so the, the rule I sketched to you was just a quick sketch in my scratch wrapper. The one that F star implements, I think, will let you prove this ah. by collapsing them. Ah, okay. So it's not like ordered uh, context or something, ordered context of refinement. No, it's not. Yeah, okay, okay. There's no, uh, so there's no order at all or there's some dependency between the refinements? Uh, there is a, um, uh, a um, uh, it's going to normalize the refinement. If, you, if it sees, uh, okay. uh, it's going to you know, collapse them into a, a refinement with a conjunction on, on either side and then prove an implication among the conjunctions. Ah, uh, okay. I see. Uh-huh. Thank you. Um, Nikhil, there's another question. Mm -hmm. It goes as follows. Are there any limitations on the functions which can be referenced in the refinement predicates? Uh, for instance, it might not be feasible for one to uh, put a non-terminating or an, a function with effects as a refinement predicate, is that true? Are there any other conditions that one needs to be aware of? That's the, yes, you can only put total functions in uh, in uh, in refinements and no, not decidability. The uh, refinements are undecidable in FSTAR. There's no restriction in decidability. So um, uh, you can put any total function in, in a refinement, but it has to be total. Okay. So you can't put, um, you know, yeah, you can't put effectual things in refinements. Um, right. Yeah, a, a remark on decidability. So, you know, um, um, if you see my slides online, there's a, there's a, a past the demo, there are a few more slides there saying a, a couple of things about decidability and extensionality and so on. Um, so, uh, uh, extensional type theory in general, and even the variant of it, which star implements, is not decidable. And um, that's. Um, 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 so in principle, F star can, can loop when trying to type check your program, but the SMT solver can do that in any case. Uh, so uh, we, um, we do not restrict anything in F star to be decidable. Oh, hi, Nikhil, I had a question yeah. regarding, uh, regarding the termination in recursive functions. So uh, do we have to specify, uh, like, do we have to like provide a manual proof of termination of a recursive function in F star or does there exist any tactic uh, like which automates the, uh, I mean, termination proof with respect to some decreasing measure? Right, so notice that here we define several recursive functions and 
every time you define, define a recursive total function, which these are in F star, F star does a termination proof behind the scenes. So uh, uh, in this case, for instance, reverse, uh, the recursive call is, um, there it is, sorry. Uh, the recursive call uh, is reverse on tail and F star knows, notices that tail is a subterm of V and uh, that means that the recursion is on a um, a smaller um, a smaller term, and so it's actually terminating. Actually, I just okay. noticed something that, in fact, over here, F star will notice that the first, the argument that precedes it, n, is actually in this case the recursive call is on n minus one. So that that alone is enough for F star to to conclude that it's terminating. The fact that tail is a sublist does not matter. <laughs> 